up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of the Black Top Podcast. We're coming to you right after Game 6, right after the Golden State Warriors secured the 2022 NBA Championship. And yeah, as you can see, we're two men gaming it here right now. Oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Got the boy Ruben right beside me. Unfortunately, Chris was feeling a little under the weather. Hope you feel better soon, Cuzzo. But yeah, Ruben. I think you picked the perfect little gif to uh, start us off with. How you feeling, man? I'm feeling good, man. I'm shimmying, you know. I'm pretty sure I called uh, the Warriors in six at the beginning of our predictions for this finals. Um, I, I did say I wanted to go seven, but I felt in my heart that it was six, and I was correct. If I feel like all three of us were, were low-key right. called that. I think, I think all of us did. I think all of us did. So I think we're all right there. Uh, I'm happy because, you know, there's a lot of things to be happy about. We'll, we'll touch on that later, but life is good. Christian, get well sued, bro. We love you. See you back on the pod, us three. I know we've gone kind of rogue the last couple of weeks. So it's just like two men gaming it a little bit, but, you know, yeah. we'll get the back shots pod together, all three of us three something again. A little disclaimer. <laughs> last week's episode was lost because, uh, for whatever oh. reason, my mic wasn't connected to OBS. It was a banger, though. We, like... I'm not going to spoil too much about it, but just know once we kind of take what we did there and apply it to the other ones, it's going to be some good stuff. But with that being said, game six, you know, when you think of that, you got Jackson, Tyson, Jordan, Jordan, game six, Clay six, Clay six, game six, Clay. Unfortunately, he didn't, he, he, no, he did not have a game six Clay kind of day, but Ruben, bro, how'd you feel about that game six, man? So initial reactions is Boston went off to a strong start, and it was exactly what they needed, that boost of energy. They were really up on the ball defensively. They were really good offensively, getting really good shots, and they were hitting those shots like with ease. And I think typically what you like to see is how will a team respond after the first timeout? Because what happens is you got that huge adrenaline rush. You're like, oh, yeah, you know what? For sure. Like, this is our game. This is our game. The first timeout gets called. Boston has to respond. You already know Golden State is going to make a run. So how will you respond? And watching them just kind of fold throughout the game, try to make little runs here and there. But I don't think even after that first run that they made to come back and when Steph hit that three to give them the lead, they never really found their ground again they never could find that rhythm again and that was really interesting because i felt like boston had that energy and it's almost like all the energy that they had in the first in that first bit of the first quarter once that timeout was called it was kind of like i think they thought they won the championship at that very moment or at least they thought they were going to extend the series and so anyways, that was my first reaction to the whole game. It was like, dude, they never really recovered after that first run. And Steve Kerr called that timeout. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll speak on the rest of the game. But, I mean, how do you feel about it? Because I'm pretty sure you have a lot of thoughts <laughs> watching this game. Because, dude, you, you we were texting back and forth. And you were literally oh, yeah, like... This is good banter. Good, good. Back yeah. Like one thing you said to me that was so interesting was, like, Boston was so one and done. But... I felt like they could have gotten any shot they wanted to, but I'll let you I'll let you talk about that because you had a lot of thoughts on Boston's end. Yeah, no doubt. I'll, frankly, when it comes down to it, I feel like the only people who really came to play today were Al Horford and uh, Robert Williams III, low-key. Yeah. And Robert Williams III, considering that he's still not even 100%. You know, all things set aside, I'm very excited to see what the future holds for that dude. Hope his knee's okay, though, considering that Again, he tore his shit, and that's normally like a, a year plus out or whatever. But, no, yeah, I definitely agree. I didn't see that first bit that you were talking about just because I was coming from school. But when I did hop back on, that was when the Warriors, like, responded and were able to take that first punch. And from there on out, we're, we're kind of just punching down at the Celtics throughout the entire game. And I agree. I think... What the Celtics were able to do was respond in spurts, but what you saw was when it got to about that 9.7 point difference, you know, Golden State really got the ball back rolling. I think it played a lot like how, honestly, I think with Game 5, Boston definitely should have won that game, and this would have been a similar storyline where if 
by some miracle Boston pulled this one out it would have been more so that Golden State choked it rather than Boston really balled their ass out but no uh yeah I think when it came down to it with just the fluidness we talked about this a lot in our back and forth during the game like just the overall synchronous the, the sync that Golden State was playing with was like on another level like you could tell you know it's a team that's been there before been there done that and everything and when it came to Boston they just really never were able to recover and were never really able to get back into rhythm and really have like a puncher's chance in the game in my opinion yeah i was just gonna interject it's like you can tell where experience plays a part in a game and in a series and you said it the best the warriors weren't sped up they could never get sped up throughout the game they had they had an answer to every first action being broken up And that was the difference, is because they didn't panic after they lost that first option in the play. Um, And and I don't know, I don't know how many set plays they ran all night, but a lot of it was off screen and roll. They would blitz. They would create. They would create a lot of hockey assists because because I mean that's the whole reason they had played drop coverage all series long is because of the fact that Steph is so good at getting out of that double team getting it to the second guy who's rolling to the basket. And oftentimes, the guy that's rolling to the basket has been Kevon Looney, Draymond Green, Otto Porter, or Andrew Wiggins. And those four guys are really good at making the pass out of the short roll. And that opened up a lot of shots. Otto Porter hit some like key open shots. Uh, Andrew Wiggins was awesome off the second action. And Draymond even had those two threes. We were talking about it. <laughs> yes! Like, oh that's God. the whole reason they had played drop coverage. But then they panicked on the defensive end. And then on the offensive end, it was like the moment their first play got broken up or the moment that their first look, they weren't able to find a good shot. They immediately went into, you said this, hero ball. And it was like, it was so hard to watch at one point where I was like, dude, like, I don't know how a team in the NBA Finals could be, could feel so, uh, I don't know, for the lack of a better term, amateur. I think that's the perfect felt- word, yeah. Yeah, I I just felt like it was such a huge lack of experience. And, like, yeah, you mentioned something interesting where it was like they just couldn't get sped up. The Warriors had an answer to every action. And it feels like they didn't run any plays. It was all DHOs, like, all night, pick and rolls. And, you know, they, I just feel like they didn't stick with their game plan, the Celtics. I mean, they got punched in the mouth and then they never really got back up. And that's tough. Like, you would think that... Um, you know, a guy like Jason Tatum who had been preaching Mambo mentality all year long. And, sorry, you know, I, I'm not the type of guy to try to make it a narrative play, but, like, how many times had he been mimicking Kobe throughout the whole year? And there was none of that uh, in him throughout the series. Like, he didn't really come up big. Jalen Brown was awesome, though. I would have to say Jalen Brown, like, he did his absolute best uh, in this game, although he came up short, like... You know, it's just one of those things where you look at it as like, yeah, this is still a really young team. Like, their stars are really young guys, and they've never been here before. Like, they, uh, do they have a single player that made the finals? No, right? We touched on this before. They don't have a single player that made the finals before. No, yeah, Al Horford had the most, and he had the record for most playoff games without a finals appearance. Yeah, so, um, and it, it's no secret that he performed well tonight because he just, you know, he knows how to perform in the big moment. Um, Robert Williams didn't really have much to lose, right? Obviously, he's coming off that injury, and he's just out there trying to give you anything you have. And Jalen Brown was a second option tonight, and he just you know made things work. But yeah, I don't know. It was almost difficult to watch. If I was a Celtics fan, I'd be really disappointed. But at the oh, same time, sure. it's like I mean, they were booing like the home fans were booing their own team like halfway through the first quarter. Yeah, but I think this was about like like we said, like I think we said this like before the series. No matter how this series is going to end, I think the Celtics and the organization overall is going to be really happy with the fact that they even got here in the first place. Cuz, you know, that's a lot of really good that's what, like Jason Tatum hasn't missed the playoffs since he's since he's come into the league, right? No, I don't think so. Maybe the first. Yeah, so, no, no, I mean, he's made it every time. That's a value that's valuable experience for this kid. So, anyways, like yeah, initial thoughts. I mean, I'm so happy for the Warriors. Like Steph Curry Finals MVP. I'm sure we'll touch on the all the uh, award stuff and all the narrative stuff afterwards. But in terms of a game, man, like that was just as as good of like a clinic in oh, a closeout man. game. 
when your team got put through a clinic, you know you had a rough day. But that's definitely yeah. what it was, yeah. <laughs> Dude, they got put through a clinic. Like, oh my god. Like, Steph got whatever he wanted. They got took to Draymond. When, like, you know, that's the thing. When a guy like Draymond is feeling it offensively, and he has that kind of night where it's like he hits those key shots, like, and his threes came at key moments, pivotal moments in the game where the Celtics were making those spurts, like you mentioned. Yeah, they were And even Draymond like... was hitting those shots. Yeah, they weren't even like challenge threes. They were no. they were literally like in rhythm, wide open, wide open, good plays. Yeah, he didn't force the issue. I thought that after he hit those threes, he started to look for his offense a little more. That made him more of a threat, and then it opened everything else up. Steph is hitting his shots. Draymond's feeling himself a little bit. Your other guys like Otto Porter are performing. Um, I mean, how much did he score? He had. I'm just gonna quickly look. Draymond or Otto? Otto. Otto, Otto, he had two big threes. Wiggins had 18. Um, Jordan Poole came off and had 15 for you, even though he didn't really shoot that well from the field. Like, um, I mean, overall, it was a really good performance by all of the guys, you know? So, yeah, yeah I, I think, think the best, like, like we mentioned, the best way to put it is a clinic. Definitely. When it came to the Warriors, the only, like, weakness, I think, was just the fouls, especially in, like, the third quarter where Gary Payton picked up, what was it, like two or three quick ones, and that led to one of the first little runs where the Celtics were able to cut it to single digits. At the end of the day, I think, again, it was more so when it came to the Celtics, they were just like, they just had no rhythm. Just like you were perfectly saying, a lot of DHOs, a lot of yeah. ISO baskets. Marcus Smart touched the ball a lot more on the offensive end than I personally would have liked. You know, we had a few cool buckets here and there, but a lot of them were like one and done possessions. And right after that, back to being on defense and then get scored on and the lead just continued to increase. Yeah, I think it also it was tough for Tatum to get into any rhythm because he caught those three early fouls. And yeah, um, that's how you knew it was going to be like a long night. Yeah, it was going to be a long night when your star player is just struggling on the defensive end like he can't. When he can't get into a rhythm, it's kind of like it. It it's a contagious thing, right? Like your confidence goes down because if your star player just can't be on the floor, it's it's a difficult thing to find that um, to find that confidence, right? Like that that's kind of your concrete guy. That's your that's your pylon. It's a guy that's always there, kind of thing, and that's the reliability wasn't there tonight for them. Um, but I mean, like. You know, you look you look at the plus minus and stuff like that. I mean, he was only a minus two. Like the rest of the team, you know, was pretty damn bad. But you know, like I said, I think these guys are just going to learn from it. I think that's a positive outcome to come from this, regardless, because nobody thought Boston would have made the finals this year after the start that they had. Mm -hmm. um, if anything, the narrative is more so like, man, it's finally about time. You know, Steph got his his finals MVP, which he long deserved, and, and Clay gets to win a championship in his first season back from missing two years, two and a half, well, yeah, two years, and, you know, um, you know, Draymond gets to shut up all the naysayers, you know, in a huge game six, near triple-double, 12, 12, and 8. Like, that's crazy, man. Like, that's how you know these guys are special. Like, that that core is so special because they've, they've answered every call. Everyone said, okay, they can't win without KD. They did it. Everyone said Draymond's trash. He finished with a near triple double. Clay comes back from injury, and he's obviously one of the most important pieces on this team. Steph Curry, it was like people talked about how he's never really been able to perform in the finals. He had two of the biggest games of his career in these finals against the best defense in the league. I mean, it's almost like you, all the narratives are they're gone. Like you know, they they washed out every single nar narrative that there was against the Warriors. So at this point, it's kind of like. You got to give it up to this dynasty. 100%. I think when it comes down to it, they're right there with the Heatles, in my opinion. I think it's 1A, 1B. And I think, in my opinion, I have the Warriors as 1A. Strictly because uh, in the post-game interviews, Andre Udall was talking about this, how when it comes to like this big three and how it was formed, you know, as great as Clay and Steph are, as much as they're these generational shooters, these guys who have you know, been in the limelight, who've never been phased by the NBA lifestyle, by the media and all that stuff. Draymond Green, I think, has really been that, been that glue guy. And even, you know, outside of basketball, it seems like he's very much, you know, the leader in the sense that 
Yeah. You know, he's the engine, I feel. As much as Clay's like driving that shit without Draymond Green, you know, the system that they have crumbles, I feel. Well, he's the emotional leader, right? Like, mm-hmm. I think it's kind of like, as you said, he's the engine that makes it tick because a lot of the edge that they have, so a lot of their offensive prowess and what they're known for, the star power comes from a Steph and a Clay because they are two of the greatest shooters of all time, two of the greatest shooters ever. And then, but they're not very vocal guys, right? In the sense of when it comes to leadership, these guys aren't going to pull you through. These guys aren't going to start scuffles. These guys aren't going to have that that edge where it's like, you got to get in fights and stuff like that. Draymond's that guy where you step on the court, you're going to have confidence that this dude's going to have your back. And he backs it up with the way he plays. He's always been a really good playmaker. Defensively, he's their anchor. Like, he was, like, and, sorry, I'm, like, I'm like going on so many tangents because there's so many, so many different things to talk about. Steph was so good defensively. Oh. Tonight? Yeah. Throughout the entire, like, playoff run. Especially well, to, yeah, series. throughout the, yeah, you're right. Like, throughout the entire playoff run, he was so freaking good. And, like, um, he was never known for how good he was defensively. He's never been great defensively. He's always been a liability on that end. And then all, all of a sudden, in year, what, 13 at 34 years old? Is he 34 now? He is, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fact that he's he's a very reliable defender now. I mean, just the way he was defending Tatum um, when he got switched on because they were hunting that matchup and, and he was poking balls loose. He's standing his ground. Um, a lot of that stems from the fact that you have a guy like Draymond who can hold you accountable on the defensive end, right? And a lot of their defensive identity that they've had since 2015 has always been around the fact that they have a guy like Draymond Green who's like one of the most um, versatile. He, you know, he might go down as probably the most versatile, versatile defender of all time because of what he's been able to do, right? Like he's been he's been that secondary defender. He's been that anchor when they had no center. Um, he's been that guy that guards the, the best player. Um, awesome communicator. So, uh, yeah, like you said, the glue piece that kind of brings that whole ship together is is Draymond. Clay is kind of that offset star. Steph is obviously the ultra star. And they're just a special core dynamic, which, again, was developed internally. Mm, that's the best part of it. Yeah, I agree. And so, developed internally, and then you see what they've done with young guys like um, Gary Payton, even though he's not as young anymore, but, and then you see, like, at certain moments throughout the year, Kaminga, Moses Moody having really good series, Jordan Poole's obviously developed into one of the better players in the league, and then you see rejuvenation of careers, like Nemanja Bielitsa, he's been an important factor of their team throughout the year at certain moments, and then we were going to mention this, Andrew Wiggins and Otto Porter. Two guys who are lottery picks, like Andrew Wiggins is their number one pick. Otto Porter was a top three pick, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, no, he was two or three. Wasn't I think, he? I think yeah. it was the Anthony Davis draft, wasn't it? Or it might have been the year after. Um, he was drafted. Sorry, I'm just going to take a quick look. Number three in the 2013 draft. 2013 draft. Is that the Wiggins Number draft? one. Who was the 2013 draft? 2013. Oh yeah, that's the year after after Anthony. So it would have been. It was uh, it's oh, it's, wait, it's a different oh, Anthony. Oh my god, it's a different How Anthony. Anthony that? Bennett. Because that man got drafted in that same draft. Yeah, dude. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, Otto Porter was third. People was like, he's a bust. He could never really find his ground, and then he comes in as, like, he looks like that next Andre Iguodala. Right, and then Andrew Wiggins, obviously the narrative around here, everyone knows about his his pitfall a little bit of like he could never compete. He's not. He's a bust as a number one pick, and then he ends up being an all star starter and wins the championship in this year. So it's like, you know, the Warriors organization is kind of like a, a unicorn. No, yeah, I honestly, I think all the Andrew Andrew Wiggins narratives are so laughable in that I, I feel like we use the word bust so so loosely when it comes to like mm. the nba mm-hmm. for like in my opinion i feel like to be a bust you have to average like below 10 points and after your rookie contract you're kind of vying to even get a one-year deal you no know, that's never been a problem for andrew wiggins granted 
know, when you have the name Maple Jordan and, you know, the best Canadian prospect like ever kind of labels on you, obviously you're going to have that heightened expectations. But when it comes down to it, I think even being like a serviceable role player, wherever you're drafted is like, I don't think that's enough to consider you a bust. It, yeah. Obviously when you get, you're the number one overall pick, you're going to be in the light of like LeBron's, Hakeem Olajuwon, Shaquille O'Neal's and yeah. all that. And that will never change. Yeah. As long as like, you're able to contribute to winning, which also a little jab at the Minnesota Timberwolves is definitely not known for that. I think when it comes to, aside from the culture they're starting to build now, I mean, you saw like KG, a generational talent who left partially because of the fact that, you know, the winning wasn't always the number one priority. Now you see Andrew Wiggins. And I think, you know, Obviously, when it comes to the NBA, financial stability is always such a big thing. But at the end of the day, yeah. the real ones, the dogs, they know it's about winning. And Andrew Wiggins is 100% gangster certified. You know, he has a PhD in being a dog. Yeah, 100%. He showed that in the series. And I think that was like, that was um the thing that was most important. And like... He hit the nail on the head with regards to Minnesota. Like, there's just a lot of franchises that just don't have that culture of winning, and so there's so there like there's a lot of teams who have always been really good the last decade, developing talent, getting the most out of their players. Um, Miami, Toronto, Golden State. Um, uh, I do want to say Boston because I mean Boston has been there almost every year. Um, yeah, there's yeah, a number of other teams. I would I say Memphis those now. You mentioned, like- yeah. And yeah, in terms of developmental programs and building that organized, like that culture of winning, Toronto only won in 2019, but they had been making the playoffs since 2014. They'd always been there, like one of the top teams in the league. Toronto ends up being a top four team in the league this year. Yeah, um, the makeup so of like, their rosters is like, on that championship roster, who's the highest drafted player? Because like all of those guys are like, it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'm sure it was a guy who didn't even play, right? I don't think so. I think it might have been OG. I what might was, be wrong there. What was the? Well, all the like Kyle was what twenty fourth or something like that. A lot. A yeah, Kyle, Kyle. Yeah. OG I mean, Fred was been... not drafted. Uh, uh, tra- uh, Danny Green was a second round pick. Excuse me. Um, I think it might have been OG because he was 23rd. What was Kawhi in that draft? 17? Kawhi, Kawhi was... In 2011? Kawhi was right after Clay, so that would have been... He, 12 he might have been the highest draft in that year. Here, let me look it up. But I mean, I mean, like, the... the, the, the whatever we're saying it kind of stands across all these teams, right? It's like... It's like Steph wasn't even a top five pick. Draymond was a second round pick. Clay went in the in the early te- teens. Um, Jordan Poole was a 30th? late first rounder. He was 29th or like 30th. Yeah. It was he 29th? Yeah. So it's like, and then you look at a team like Miami where they've been able to pull gems out, right? And so a lot of these programs, like they don't need, um, they're, they're really good at developing ta- talent internally, sticking with what they know the best, really good coaching. Um like you look at the Spurs, even like even though they haven't been successful, like they managed to work themselves into a play-in tyranny when everyone thought they're going to be the one of the worst teams in the league. At one point, they were the worst team in the league, record-wise, and then they made a play-in. So, so it's like, you know, coaching coaching has a lot to do with it. Winning organization, like having good a re- really good front office, and then those stars just have to be able to buy in, right? And so you see it across those different teams. But I did want to ask you. Because I really want to know your thoughts, because you kind of followed this team a bit closely, especially because yeah. they played Milwaukee in the second round. Is what do you think's missing the most for Boston? I think we've covered a lot of the narratives that we talk about with the Warriors. Congrats mm. to them! But I think like we all know that the Warriors' window's closing. They maximize this year, and they'll probably maximize on it the next year or two. But for Boston to continue to get back to this. I think there's a lot of things missing, but I want to know your thoughts because I feel like you've seen this team a lot more closely than I have, especially because they, they played the Bucks in the second round. So, <laughs> uh, That's a good, good question. Well, I think, first of all, the main question to address is like the status of Al Horford. I mean, I don't think he's going to retire or anything, 
But yeah. he's what, 36 now, heading into like his age 37 season. He's not LeBron James. So I think if he's still serviceable, I think your front court's pretty set in terms of like your starting lineup. I think the main thing they were missing was kind of an actual true big off the bench. Because I think, you know, as much as Grant Williams is that fire hydrant, PJ Tucker build, I don't think he's really grown into that role so far. He's shown like spurts of it here and there, but I don't know if I'm fully putting my eggs all into that basket for him to truly guard like four and fives like solidly. So I, I would definitely look to get like a true, true center potentially. Like I think a Nerlens Noel would be perfect in that in that role. But also, low key, here's a hot take. I think Jason Tatum's final run is a bit overrated because in the sense that, I mean, he has probably one of the worst records you'd ever want to hold now and that he has the most turnovers ever in a playoff run with 100. 100, dude, that's that insane. insane. But... uh, In six games, right? Oh no! Overall, yeah, sorry. Overall, overall the, the entire season. series. Yeah, sorry. I came out in six games. I was like, yeah, hundred turnovers. turnovers. And how many games have they played? I think it's six. Tw- twenty-four, maybe. Wait, no. So four, six, maybe. Is that four turnovers a game? And... Yeah, is that he's averaging, averaging four, turnovers four turnovers a game. A game. But my point is that when you look at Jason Tatum. And like kind of <laughs> the trajectory of his career, he's always been a bucket. He's always been a guy that, you know, put the ball in his hands. We're going to go home. We're going to live and die off of that. And with this playoff run, it was a lot of the same. You know, he was a complete dog in the first round, complete dog in the second round, complete dog in conference finals. When it came to here specifically, but also throughout the entire playoff run, you saw him really show his prowess as a playmaker i feel that whole kind of shade being thrown their way in the early years like the two j's can't exist because they're too like ball dominant two scorers heavy you saw that kind of thrown out the window in the sense because you saw i think what game one jason tatum had 12 points but like 13 assists or something like that and with that though i feel it's a double-edged sword in that a lot of these turnovers i feel were generated by the fact that either jason tatum passed up a shot or is another thing i think is wrong forcing the issue that and yeah. with a lot of these like the driving kick era of the nba you're always kind of driving and it's sort of you know your offense is set up in a way that you're 100 percent sure a guy should be here but yeah. with that that everybody's keen in on that you're able to fill the passing lane like a little quicker i feel a lot of it was generated off of that so i think aside from getting a real big man another big man maybe even another like ball handling guard potentially but i i think Derek white would be fine with that i think it's jason tatum really finding that perfect balance between scoring and playmaking because i feel for a lot of the playoff run i'm saying that a lot he's shown the ability to be one or the other but there haven't been too many games where yeah he's meshing it right down the middle there i think that's the next step he needs to take and i think he's fully capable of doing that i mean during like the closing moments you saw draymond like i don't know if it was jason tatum who was telling one of the sellers like y'all will be back and i think the way this roster is constructed you know how jason tatum got screwed out of 50 million dollars how he's low-key not going to be paid the way he should be paid Mm -hmm. they're definitely poised to make another run Unless that might can I, anything about it, Loki. Can I can I interject? You know why you hit the nail on the head on that with with Jason Tatum and like that mesh coming together. You know why you were so right on that? Because you follow that dude. He's the best dude that does it. Giannis is the best dude at meshing his ability to score and play make, and his ability like it's 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 that innate sense. It's like that 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 third sense where we've seen so many times all year. Giannis attacks the paint and it's like he needs to kick it out at the last second because they crash and they've got that wall and he just knows that a guy is there and Giannis is probably the best dude in the league at, at doing that right now um, and at one point it was LeBron but right now it's it's definitely Giannis 
with Tatum, the thing that he has though, it's 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 his ability to score from anywhere on the floor. Giannis doesn't necessarily have that, even though he's developed that. But Jason Tatum, in terms of his ability to score from the perimeter, his ability to drive, to create looks in the paint, he's got the ability to pull up in the mid-range. He's as 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 pure a scorer as you can get. And then you saw the sides where he's able to play make. But the problem with his meshing too, and I think like because of the fact that a lot of the players on the on the team, like Marcus Smart is is while he's improved his three point shooting, he's not a reliable three point shooter. Like he's not a guy that you're gonna kick out to the corner and say, "Oh man, damn!" Like that's that's the shot. Yeah, that's something like, low key you live you live with. Because he you live with. And he exactly. got very trigger happy. I feel he got very trigger happy, right? And with Jalen Brown, he's a guy that does need the ball, right? He's not he's not your typical catch and shoot player. So when your secondary star isn't a guy who's Chris Middleton and is good with the ball and or coming off with off with with off ball. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just using this reference with the Bucks because like I think this just speaks or resonates more with you and people understand it because the Bucks obviously won last year and that's how they won a lot last year. And I think the biggest missing piece for Boston is is um what Marcus Smart was so good at doing all year long when they made their run, he was awful at doing in this series, and that was his ability to put guys in position to be successful. And mm-hmm. as good as Marcus Smart had improved in that department, he's not your typical playmaking point guard, and he's not a guy that you really necessarily trust with the ball to make smart decisions for his teammates. Yeah, he got like, a little away from that. Yes, exactly. And I think, I think he deferred a little too much, too. I think he deferred a little too much to, you know, giving the ball to Jalen and to Jason to make something happen. And so oftentimes when you're when you're caught in these isolation possessions and just being like, man, just give it to the star to try and find something. Your offense is stagnant, number one. Number two, you're like you mentioned in our chat back and forth, it was stagnant offense and one and done possessions. And that's the worst thing that you can get into, especially with a team like Golden State, where on a missed shot, they're pushing that thing down your throat. So I think they miss a guy that can manage pace. And while I think Derek White is a good ball handler, they don't have a guy on that team that could control the pace of the game. And so when you look at the last few championship teams, right, let's go last year. You got Giannis Antetokounmpo, who creates the pace. Drew Holiday, who you can trust with the ball to create good, to make good decisions at the back end of the clock. Who is really good at the screen and roll, his ability to create off the ball. Marcus Smart and Derek White don't necessarily have that ability. Jason Tatum has has shown his ability to play make, but he hasn't done it at a high level or an elite level like those guys. You go back further. 2020, you've got LeBron James. 2019, you have a Kyle Lowry. 2018, that team is so talented, but you have Steph Curry and Kevin Durant who create really, pace. Those guys could, yeah. Right, and Draymond Green, right? And you could go as far back as you want. 2014, Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili, Tim Duncan... You can go as far back as you want. Every championship team has a player that can control the pace of the game. And so for Boston, the reason they lost is they don't have they don't have that key player or they don't have a collection of guys who can say, all right, guys, let's put you guys here. Let's put Emi Udoka did a great job coaching all season long and in this series too, making adjustments. But like without that coach on the floor, regardless of who it is, whether it's a Draymond Green or a Giannis Antetokounmpo, where you can give that ball and then they can create that pace without getting sped up, like, again, you mentioned, I think that's the biggest thing they're missing. And do I think it's Marcus Smart? Nope. Do I think it's Derek White? Nope. So, I think they've got things to address this summer. I think that's, honestly, aside from the fact that they need a legit big, which I think it's going to be Robert Williams, even though he's a little bit low on the size part, I think that he can fill that athletically and um, I think his defensive prowess is 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 gonna fill that anyways, and and we're not in the we're not in an age where you need that seven footer down low anymore, um, and I think Robert Williams fits that perfectly. But in terms of a backup big, you thought Daniel Tice would beat that at moments, but he obviously mm-hmm. isn't isn't what he was, and um, you know Grant Williams is obviously that PJ Tucker style player, but you know Draymond Green said it best: "You want to be me." You want to be me, but you know, it, it was a uh, man. I think I think Boston has a lot to be happy about again, but you know, it, again, I think uh, they just don't have a guy who can, can control the pace of the game, who can just 
You know, you know what I mean? Like it's just that no guy doubt. who has a ball and it can just make something happen, who knows where to put you in place, who can demand the attention and number one, the respect of the star players. Because mm, I don't think Jason Tatum and, and Jalen Brown are giving the ball to Marcus Smart and going, All right, take control the pace, brother. <laughs> take us home, brother. Like I love Marcus Smart, but he's not he's not that player. He's not that player. So Yeah, I don't think Boston's really had that since like R- Rajon Rondo low key. Yeah. And it- on that topic, do you think there's a guard right now that they could get and sl- slot into that role? Or do you think it's more something that you hope Marcus Smart starts or Derek White starts to get a better grasp for, you know, you know, like, I think, I think, I don't know if Derek White is that player. Marcus Smart showed signs of it, but he clearly couldn't do it in the finals. And I think it's just limitation. Like, I think you've reached a peak with what you could get out of Marcus Smart on the offensive end. You know what you're going to get from him on a day in to day out. He's going to be a streaky shooter. He's going to be a tough dude that can defend and rebound. He's going to make big plays. He's going to die for the ball. Like, he's that emotional leader that you need. What I do think the next step is a guy like Jalen Brown and or Jason Tatum, both of them, develop that ability to be playmakers. Like you said... I think combine that ability to score and play make and have those tools in your basket as opposed to ah uh, they're making me they're, they're they're blitzing me they're getting the ball out of my hands so I got to be a playmaker. No, if you can control the pace and be like okay, I'm going to do this tonight because this is how I think that the team can win. Like a guy like we've seen in the past, Giannis Antetokounmpo, LeBron James, again, they control the pace. They manipulate the game and I think Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum can do that. They just they don't have that they yet. Have a and I think yet. after the Exactly. So they were forced into doing it. That's how I, I'd say it. And Golden State was really good at making them get away from their game plan. And that's that's been the MO of Golden State for like the last few years. It's like you can never play your style of you can never play your style of play against Golden State. The only team that I think that successfully did it was obviously Toronto. So uh um and that's 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 no bias ish. I'm just I think that's well, sort of speaking back. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. I mean that team that team was was top to bottom one of the best defensive teams, and they had the length to guard those positions and switch. Um, I thought Boston would have that, but on the offensive end, I think that's where they lacked um, overall. But you know, I digress. It's it's a lot to unpack, but yeah, I think regardless, I mean, these these when you look at it. These were the two teams that I think deserve to be there. You know, mm-hmm. Golden State, obviously, I think if they're fully healthy, I, I think they beat Bo- Phoenix for that number one spot in the West. And then you have Boston, where everybody, even myself, was kind of like, oh, fuck, man, they're looking like a play-in team right now. When they were yeah. able to hit that next gear, it made Yudoka really, like, pulled up his pants and, like, led this team to the promised land, in a sense. And now it's kind of like, you know, what's this going to be like if we're consistent throughout the entire year and not just kind of trying to keep our head above water and then really rising to, like, the cream of the crop? What's it going to be like when we're constantly there the entire season? Which, I mean, I, I'm excited to see how Boston looks next year. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, let's see, let's, I'll be interested to see how the other players develop too. I think Robert Williams will be, his, this summer, having a full training camp in summer and him fully healthy is going to be really important to this team too. <clears throat> so like, him having a rested training camp. a break, it's that man. Dude, uh, there's so much respect I have for that guy. He just laid it all on the line. So, um, you know, it is what it is. Mm. Kind of one last little thing. Robert Williams got some underrated playmaking, man. Hey. Yeah, that, that one pass to Tatum for like the backdoor cut dunk. Whew. That's beautiful. I remember... I don't remember who it was against, but there was one game where he had a triple double and he was making such crispy passes. And one more thing, I think he's going to be the next player to have a five by five game. I think he has such versatility and he has such a high IQ and he just has all the tools, I think, that make that such a possibility for him. But yeah. We have went from 2,000 plus games, and now the NBA season is officially over. With that, we head into the juicy stuff. We're heading into the off season, baby. 
While it may be break time for the players, it's just getting started for people like us. And with that, before we end off, let's talk about one of the first big things that happened for uh, the off season. Obviously, the first actual trade was like that Jermichael Green thing, but you know, you know, Jermichael Green, Green, cool and all, but it's not as cool as this trade. So, if you aren't aware yet, the Rockets traded Christian Wood for the twenty-sixth pick in this upcoming draft, along with Trey Burke, Marquise Chris. And Boban Marjanovic. Ruben, I'm gonna hand it you off rang. to you, bro. You rang. What are you your thoughts rang. on this trade, bro, bro? I I think um So I'm gonna look at it at both sides and like you inter just interject wherever you feel like you wanna you wanna add or like at the end. Um I think for Dallas, such a great trade. Highway robbery. Highway right? robbery. Highway robbery. I think I think Houston was really dumb because Christian Wood is a hell of an asset that I think they could have, could have gotten much more for. for. Oh, um, 100%. Can I say that I think they're doing Dallas a freaking favor by doing this trade? Because, I mean, again, the reason why Chris Stapps didn't fit with this team was because of the fact that he was so not agile, not mobile. He wasn't a very good defender. Um, he was the guy that took away from Luca. There was a lot of space heating eating up. When you trade for a guy like Christian Wood, and you and I have both followed him. I think both you and I had him in our fantasy teams at one point. And did you have him on your fantasy team? I did. Yeah, he you did, did. This and I did too. I did have him this year. And I mean, from a from a, a statistical standpoint, you know you can get it. But it, the interesting, the the intriguing part is is his style of play. He's a really good second second hand creator. He's a guy that rebounds the basketball really well. Um, he's a guy that can hit the three. And he's a really good catch and shoot. He can also create. And I think the biggest thing that was missing, um, in this run at least, was having that secondary creator. Even though they had Dinwiddie and Jalen Brunson, when you're small guys, you just can't get around the bigger players, which Golden State had. They had that length. A guy like Christian Wood could offset a lot of those problems. And him in the screen and roll and the pick and pop and DHO action with Luka Doncic, it's really scary. So, number one, I think they they won that trade easily. Like, I don't think anyone would argue that for sure. Um, so I think that dynamic is going to be really interesting. And if they manage to keep Jalen Brunson this offseason, I think I'll I'll go on a, on a limb right now. I'll oh. give you a really hot take. Okay. And I think I think we're going to get a rematch of the Western Conference. I oof. You got to take into account Denver, low-key. No, the Denver. team I got to take into account is the Clippers. Oh, shit. The West is like a big toss-up next. The West is fire especially again. The West is fire again. if everybody's healthy. All right, you know what? Screw it, all right? July 16, or sorry, June 16, 10.55 p.m. now with DJ, Backshots Pod, Blacktop Pod. I'm going to say it right now. Dallas will be in the Western Conference Finals. Dallas will be back in the Western Conference Finals if they retain Jalen Brunson. If they retain Jalen Brunson. I think the Warriors are going to be really good next year, but depending on how this pool shakes up, you don't want to fall into, um, you know, seeding where you run into the Clippers, you run into Memphis, and you run into Denver. So, anyways, that's that for me on that side. The Houston Rockets... I think it was a clear indicator that, okay, they're going to give the keys to Alper and Sangoon. They wanted to clear up time. Then they also get another draft pick this year, which I think is really valuable. I think the back half of this draft actually is quite good. I think in terms of the star talent, I don't know if it's there as it was last as this past draft, but I think the depth of this draft is not bad. And I think um, having the 26 pick is good. Uh, Again, it's it's mostly open up cap space. You know, I don't think Marjanovic is going to stay in Houston um, from the reports that I've read um, from other media sources. Uh, Marquise Chris is, is obviously rehabbing his knee injury. Um, Trey Burke is a nice piece, but uh, he's obviously not going to stick around, or if anything, he's just going to play out his contract in Houston. Um, I don't know how many years he has left. I, I didn't really look into that part, but ultimately they, they just – Wanted to open up time for Alper and Sangoon, who showed a lot of promise this year, and then get that extra draft pick and open up some cap space. 
Um, Christian Wood also played, like, what, half of the games this year? I mean, he was sick half the time for whatever reason it was. So, um, you know, I think it was just a good trade on both ends. Obviously, he, uh, Dallas won it, but, I mean, it makes sense. I just think Houston could have gotten so much more for Christian Wood. I think there was just so much more on the table that you probably could have gotten from other teams. Um but it's also kind of a lie for me to say that because I'm sure they probably tested the market to see what else they could have gotten for Christian Wood. Um, you know, there's multiple, so many teams that would have loved to have Christian Wood on their on on, on their roster. So, uh, you know, interject where you feel. I mean, that's just kind of my main thoughts about this trade. No, yeah, I think. But I, I I really like I really like the direction for Dallas. You covered all the bases on that. I think what it does for Houston is it gives you another first round pick to really take a swing on because I mean we look at it last year Jalen Green upper in Shangoon who who's low-key already proving to be somewhat of a home run of a pick you have Josh yeah. Christopher who could really I think he has a chance to really be a good microwave scorer off the bench this year especially if they move on from Eric Gordon and then even guys like Usman Garaba who didn't really get any burn like last year this might be his chance to finally step in and I agree with this upcoming draft. It's very much a three-headed like horse race from and from there kind of like there are solid players and there's just like even more kind of like, you know, good guys that could develop into solid rotational like end of your bench but guys that you need kind of rotational players and I think evidently that's maybe what the 26 pick is for. Either that or I really hope this is wrong, but I did hear that Houston shopping around that pick. I really hope they don't do that. But I don't know. Maybe this is another thing just for them to like maybe package with that. I don't know. Yeah, I really hope that's wrong though. But yeah, I think it's just another thing for your team to really kind of tank slash make sure your young guys get all the burn as possible. Now what it does for the Mavericks is I think Luca has a clear, like, number two, number three option now, especially if they retain Jalen Brunson. You know, when it comes to Christian Wood, he comes from that Milwaukee stock, baby. He's a walking 20 and 10 a night <clears throat> when he really wants to be. Uh, but I think what's really going to happen here is we're going to see him take another step, I feel. And it's because he's going to be similar to the Wiggins situation where he's going to come into a winning culture because when Christian Wood arrived in Houston, he really expected to be that one-two punch with uh, James Harden. Obviously, that didn't happen. And then now he got thrusted into being kind of big bro when he himself's not even really that much of a big bro in a sense. So I no. think what we're going to see here is a Wiggins situation. I'm not saying he's going to be an all-star starter. What I'm saying, though, is that the promise he showed in Houston, I think, is going to blossom into even more fruits. You know, I think he's going to be, I'm going to call, like, around 22 and 10, especially considering he's going to be playing with one of the best playmakers in the league right now. All the pick and pops, all of the, like, the crazy, like, passes that only Luka could do. Christian was going to be one of the main beneficiaries from that. I will say, though... I think they're poised for another run, but what they do need is like a legit center. You know, the small, small stuff is cool, but evidently I feel like for a roster to still be solid and able to contend, especially in the West next year, if everybody's healthy, I think is a legit center. Now, obviously Golden State's kind of like the, the outlier of that, but that's because they got a Steph Curry. But, yeah, well, I mean, Kevon Looney really, really developed this year. Oh yeah, I mean, he's what, not. He's he not, had a twenty-two like rebound game. He, he was all. I mean, he was awesome all year, man. Like, and and again, they're adding their real center next year. Mm. They're adding James Wiseman back next year, right? So, um, I mean, that's scary to think about. And then you got Kaminga and Moody, who were awesome this year, and then they get a year, they get a championship in their first year under their belt, and then. You know, it's just it's just like you know, outlaw. It it you are right though that I do think that championship teams need to have that legit center, right? And like, what have the past few years been? They've had that. They've had that legit guy. Um, 
you know, or or size, right? Sizes are such an important thing, and and I feel like that's why you know a team like Toronto, um, a team like LA, a team like Milwaukee, obviously were able to be successful. Golden State's a bit of an outlier, but again, they had a lot of size. Kevin, when your best player, Kevin Durant, has you know guard skills at six eleven, six ten, and then you've got uh, Draymond Green, and you have all the switchability. I mean, size matters. It's it is an important thing. You size size does matter at the end of the day, especially when the game slows down. You know, you got to have the guy that protects the paint and 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 um, is able to dominate a lot of control within you know the colored colored part of the rim or part of the part of the court. But yeah, I mean, I I pretty much agree with you there. I think that's I think that's a needed piece for any roster if you look at it that way. Hundred percent. With that being said, though, Ruben, here's a bit of a curveball. You know, with free agency upcoming, who would you say is a player that is going to get a bag, but is not really a guy you'd expect to get a bag? Like, who do you think is a player that, not necessarily that they're going to be overpaid, but is somebody that is not in the realm of a Zach Levine or a Bradley Beal, but is going to get, you know, a decent bag? I said his name earlier, and I'm going to say it again. Probably it's Jalen Brunson. I think I think he's he's the guy that's probably in that next tier that's going to be okay this guy's going to get a bag because he performed so well but as much as I like Brunson the reason why I like him is because he fits so well with what Dallas does he fits perfectly with what Dallas does now do you put him on another team and he's your lead ball handler I don't know I don't know if I would do that he's so good at playing off of uh, attention so if you throw him on a team like the Knicks and you expect him to be Jalen Brunson averaging 18 points and whatever assists that he did in um, the playoffs, I think you're in for a little bit of a disappointment because like a lot of the tension generated, a lot of his looks, a lot of his ability to, to create and score and do the things that he was so successful at all year long is because of the fact that he's playing alongside other great players. Now, granted... A lot of his success where his name came up a lot was because of the fact Luca was injured. That makes sense. So when you get more opportunity, you do get more shots, you do get more ability to shine. But on a long-term basis, when you don't have that guy, and Julius Randle, let's be real, is not that guy. Um, you know, and, and obviously... The reason why I'm bringing them up is because the Knicks have been been uh, one of the biggest teams that are interested, one of the biggest names interested, or, or all year long it's been talked about. But... He's definitely going to get a bag, whether it's with Dallas or some other team this year. Um, but he's definitely not a guy I would say, yeah, man, you got to go out and get him. I want, you know, that's that's what I'm saying to Zach Levine. I'm not, I wouldn't say that about a guy like Jalen Brunson, even though he was really good this year. But again, I think circumstance. You're you are a product of your environment more often than not, and so that's why also, and I hate to say this. Because I love him to death. If you were to do the same thing with Fred Van Vliet and plug him into another team, I don't know he would have the same success he would be having in Toronto. Oh, it's solid. Yeah, I feel he's gonna get a, a contract similar to Fred Van Vliet. That's 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 my call. Uh, I think that makes sense for me. I think GP two is gonna get a decent bag from somebody. You know, he's a guy that was on the cusp of not even playing in the league anymore. Everybody knows the story. Got cut. Ask if there's a video coordinator role just so he can remain close to the team. And now that man is an NBA champion. Now, obviously, because he does play the positions of the Golden State Warriors' most prominent like position, uh, there wasn't that much room for him to get like solid, solid minutes. But when, when he was on the court, you know, I don't think it's a stretch to say if he's getting complete like 25 minutes a game, he could be like an all NBA defender at the guard position. And I think some people are going to fall in love with the spurts that they did see. And I can see him being offered a nice little like last contract before he like turns into like the late, the early, late 30s. And on top of that though, I also feel he is the kind of guy that would say, fuck that, I'm just going to run it back. But if there's a player I think is on the watch to potentially get a bag without knowing, without 
kind of the common belief they're going to get one, I think GP2 is potentially in that realm. Just because he gives you so much athleticism. And he's one of the best defending guards in the league already. And yeah, I think... But I, I agree. The product of the environment thing is going to be a big factor. And I think that if he does leave, I, I think you're going to be very disappointed with the product you get. But yeah, I think he's potentially on the cusp of that. Yeah, I mean, there's. I'm just looking at the list now. Like, there, there's a. It, it's not a. It's not a. Can't say it's a heavy pool of free agents this year, right? Zach Levine's obviously the biggest one in terms of like who is, um, you know, the in terms of the the names that are going to be involved in free agency this year. But it's like you know, I think this is going to be an interesting off season because I think. Um, a lot of the acquisitions that'll be made for some of these teams are just getting these guys back from injury, right? And I think, um, you know, I think that's just that. Uh, I think that's it. I don't think we're gonna see a whole lot of movement. I don't think we'll see as much movement this summer. I'm probably gonna be wrong, which will be nice because I love drama in the NBA. Um, I don't think Russell Westbrook gets moved. So, anyways, like I'm just I'm just kind of spitballing like random names at this point because. Yeah, looking at the free agency tracker, looking at the names that are that are that are up for contract, and you know us looking at you know Jalen Brunson and GP two being the guys getting bags. It's like yeah, I think it, I think this is going to be a fairly quiet off season compared to the rest. Um, I'm trying to think about players getting traded, I think the trade market is going to be big this year, just considering the the lack of names in the free agency market. And obviously, teams like like Utah falling apart. We're definitely going to see one of those guys get traded this summer. So, yeah, I think. Uh, who do you think? Who do you think benefits the most from Utah? Let's say you let's 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 go with let's go with this down this road because I do want to ask you. All right. Utah Utah splits up. I think we've already talked about this before because I do want to get your thoughts. Utah splits up with with either Donovan Mitchell or Rudy Gobert. Who do you? Th- which team do you think gains the most, or should be a team that looks at one of those two players? And which team would that be in terms of like, if they got this player, they are automatically a contending team. Ooh, that's a good good question. Uh, frankly. This is a little off. Uh, it's still on topic, whatever. I just want to see Rudy Gobert play with a player who will actually pass on the fucking ball. You know, there's that astounding stat that Joe Ingles passed to him more this year, and he wasn't playing for almost half the season. But yeah, I think the team that is probably most in the market, as as cliche as it is to say. I think just the narrative you could generate from Donovan Mitchell coming back home would be crazy. Now, I think with that, though, if you bring him there, you're obviously... I heard if he was to go to the Knicks, I heard RJ's off the table. So obviously you're going to look to guys like Quinn and Grimes, Cam Reddish. A lot of your young core is gone. Yeah, Julius Randall, maybe even. But I think with that, Donovan Mitchell is a player that will put asses in seats. But unless the rest of the team is kind of fleshed out, won't really bring you to the promised land. I and I think what Utah's lacking is kind of cohesion and the ability to spread spread the ball around because when it came to that first round against the Mavericks, it was if, if you shut down Donovan Mitchell, the rest of the team's fucked. Cause one, yeah. he don't, he's not passing to his other player that's getting max money Two, Mike Conley was a bit of a shell of himself. And three, uh, anytime Royce O'Neal shoots the ball, I'm a like, bit of a shell, a bit of a shell. <laughs> that, that Michael, Mike Mike Conley is washed. Conley is, that, yeah, he's that brother washed. is washed. <laughs> <laughs> that brother is washed. But yeah, I, I agree, though. I definitely I think you trade Donovan just because he seems to be the most... Not seems to be. He's definitely the most valuable because Rudy's 
going to be one of the highest paid players at like, and he's what, 30 now? Something like that. Yeah. And he's still, he just, he doesn't have the reputation slash, oh yeah, he doesn't have the reputation that Donovan Mitchell had. Donovan Mitchell, he could put up a stinker. Everyone's look at, this is a guy who's put up 50 in the playoffs. When you look at Rudy Gobert, you're automatically going to think, this is a guy who got played off the fucking floor during the playoffs. Yeah. So, I think being able to put players around Rudy who can obviously score and make up for his lack of offense, but also be willing passers to pass it to him in the paint to let him get his, I think is something that will contribute to the Jazz's potential success in splitting up this core. Can I give you a team? Hmm? I'll give you a team right now that can do exactly that. Okay. The Atlanta Hawks. For them to get Rudy or? Yes. I've seen that, but I feel like you just give up so much. Ah! Well, I mean. I don't think they would. What, what would the package? The package is obviously probably like Capella and Collins, right? I think it would be those two. But the reason why I think that works so well, if they were to get Rudy, they is because have, of the fact. Depth at the wing position. Yeah, they have a lot of depth at the wing position. And DeAndre Hunter, Rudy Gobert, into the floor. exactly. You're looking at more time for the young players, Trey Young and Rudy Gobert. You hide him on defense. You obviously will be able to have that pick and roll. And Rudy Gobert is one of the best rollers. If you look analytically, what he does, like points per possession, like when he's in that situation, like he's one of the best picks. Yeah, yeah, he's he's super efficient, especially around the rim. And I think Trey Young is that guy who can get him the ball in those situations. Like people really underrate his ability in the in the screen and roll. Like Trey Young is one of the best playmakers in the league. He is easily one of the best passers in the league. Um, I wouldn't go as far as to say he is the best, but he might be top three right now, just with his ability. Like the dude, the dude was like the dude was so good this year in the screen and roll. Like. It, and 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 his running mate in that position, Clint Capella, was injured pretty much all of the season. Hence, a lot of their 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 lack of success. So, you put Rudy Gobert and Trey Young in that screen and roll. You have a lot of those shooters like Kevin Herter. You put on a uh, DeAndre uh, Hunter. What's his name? DeAndre Hunter. Jalen right? Johnson maybe gets some burn. So I'm saying. So you get the worst you know. possible backcourt of Sharif Cooper and Trey Young. <laughs> That'd no, be Loki fired. That's, that's, that's <laughs> intriguing. Kidding. Definitely. My only concern about that, though, is that Anyeka Kongwu, I think, is a guy that really showed promise and the ability to be that kind of Robert Williams, the third role. But I do like the idea of, of Trey Young and, and Rudy linking together. And back to the topic of Onyeka Kongwu, I don't, I think if that is what happens, it's not going to be on the Hawks just because Trey Young's too much of a defensive liability to, you know, go even smaller at your center position. But exactly. that is definitely intriguing as fuck. No, I'd do that. Yeah, I, right. I feel that John Collins is a player that everybody's still holding out on this All Star potential, but. I think he's forever going to be in that sort of right on the bubble, but never going to be able to like push past that bubble. You know what he is to me? Atlanta's always been in this cycle where they want to just stay competitive because it's been very hard for them to put ass in the seats, asses in the seats, and they always just want to stay competitive and just right around the bubble. You know who, 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 um, you know, and it's almost like looking at this cycle as like you look at the 2015 Atlanta team. John Collins is Josh Smith. Oh, yeah. Very good player, potential, athletic, you know, so much, so much promise, but can never really live up to it. But he's a very good player. If you put him on any team, he can contribute. You know what? I never realized Josh Smith didn't make any all star teams. I always just thought this guy, this guy's like a dog. He's averaging like sixteen and like eight, like almost every year. The dude was solid, bro. The dude was a really good player. He just never made an All Star team because he's just never found that extra gear. And John Collins is that right now. Granted, he's a bit younger, but you know, I think if they're trying to maximize asses in the seats and just staying competitive, 
maximizing the talent that they have around Trey Young. Rudy Gobert is that guy. And Clint Capella has been injured all year, so it's like, it's what are you really giving up? Josh Smith and a guy who plays 40 games a year? No, yeah, 100%. I've, That's not, you know, Nate McMillan would love that. That man that loves right? his defense, yeah. So. Yeah, oh, that's nice to think right? about. And I think that's probably the best package because another team I think would be willing to take Rudy would probably be like Charlotte, I feel. Yeah, be, that would know, be a nice place. He, him and LaMelo, mm, it fits. Him and LaMelo would be nice. I think you'd probably give Gordon Hayward just to cut, try to match the contracts. And maybe, the, do you think if you're the Jazz and the Hornets are the team that you're engaging with, are you putting, are you taking just Gordon Hayward, uh, PJ Washington, and like maybe a James Book Knight, or would you need like Miles Bridges to be thrown in just to have that potentially see, promising player? You think? See, the thing is, for sure, Utah will, will be in conversations to try and try and grab Miles Bridges, hmm. right? Um, I think you might have to give up Miles Bridges, considering Rudy Gobert's status as a player. Right, he's an all-star level player. He's a defensive player, you know, of the year. Um, and if you pair that with a guy like Lamelo Ball, that changes the way you play. And you know, Miles Bridges obviously broke out this year, but if you're getting a yeah, real bear, I do it. Yeah, yeah, I think you have to consider that, right? I think, I think if you put in a Miles Bridges, you won't have to give up a James Book night. Right, um, he hasn't really necessarily panned out. Granted, he didn't also get the playing time that I think he should have gotten, um, especially because they were trying to compete for playoff spot. But you got a really young roster; you got to let those guys kind of roll. Um, and he's a lottery pick. So, anyways, I think after the coaching change, they got Kenny Atkinson in, who's been known to really develop players, and he was there to that coach with um, you know that that D'Angelo Russell team, the greatest in the playoffs of all time, man. Yeah, man, Dude, that 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 was a fun team, man, and and Kenny Atkinson got the best out of those players. So, um, you know, a lot to talk about. I think the offseason is gonna be such a dope time. It's gonna be tight. You got anything? Got any last little comments to say, bro, bro? Uh, I mean, nothing other than we love you, Christian. Get well yeah, soon, bro. Better and soon, um, dude. Con- congratulations to Steph Curry he got his fourth ring. I'm so glad that he finally got an M Finals mm-hmm. MVP. That kind of solidifies it for him, you know. And the, I the think thing uh, that like. That everybody was holding against him, even though even if he retired without one, there's no doubt he's on the Mount Rushmore. No doubt. Oh yeah, no doubt. He's got to be. He changed the game. Hundred percent. With that being said, this has been another episode of the Black Top Podcast. We appreciate y'all tuning in. Stay safe. Stay blessed. We'll see y'all soon. Uh-huh. Peace. <laughs>